the microphone was muted, so I apologize. So I will start my introduction back over. This is Daniel Papadia. Um, <clears throat> so we'll start with a little case presentation. Um, your first patient of the day is Mr. Larry Z. He is a 60-year-old gentleman who presents with complaints of shortness of breath. Turns out he's had a chronic cough for many months, some progressive shortness of breath that has been getting a little bit worse, most significantly here in the last week or so. Um, you ask him about a smoking history. He doesn't really smoke all that much. Smokes anywhere between three to five cigarettes per day, mostly when he's on break with his work guys. You ask about his family history, not significant for any lung diseases. He does have three sons, uh, two who work with him, one who is a male model. Um, and PFTs show a mixed obstruction and restriction as well as a reduced uh, DLCO. Okay. Are the slides advancing? Are you guys seeing a chest x-ray for people that are locked in? No. All right. Give me a second. It wasn't downloading for you? No, it wasn't downloading. Try doing it from Chrome. Maybe Chrome. I'm going to get the internet explorer. Let me. Oh, is it Chrome? I don't know. I'm going to try this again. Our, is it a case presentation on the slide? Check. 
Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. We're back. Back on. All right. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Um, so as we we're talking about, you have a case. Mr. Larry Z, six-year-old gentleman presenting with complaints of shortness of breath. He's had a chronic cough for many months, as well as progressive shortness of breath that has gotten worse here over the last week or so. Not a very significant smoking history. Smokes about five cigarettes per day while on work or while at work during breaks. Family history is not significant. Has a couple of children, a couple that work with him. PFT showing a mix obstruction and restriction. DLCO is reduced here. Um, you know, prior to coming in, they got you a chest X-ray. There we go. Um, showing this. Uh, all right. This. Okay. Well, since we have chest extra conference still coming up, I'm not going to put anybody on the spot. But, um, you know, we see some nodular opacities throughout, asymmetrical. Any questions that you guys want to ask this gentleman before you're getting, you know, you're getting ready to staff this patient and you're trying to think of what may be going on? He doesn't have a huge smoking history. He got this chest x ray. You got a little bit of information from your PFTs. Um, history wise, occupational, very good. So you're like, uh, what do you do? Uh, turns out he's visiting here. He lives, you know, in a different state and uh, he works in the coal mines uh, with his son, I think Luke and Scrappy. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, Any, anything else that you want to know? We don't have a previous X-ray on him, unfortunately. So we talked to you. Getting a good no pads, good question. The other question you would want to ask is, you know, what does he do specifically, and for how long has he worked there? Um, and that'll be kind of a theme that we'll talk about. Um, I wonder if this will work. Am I? What kind of coal? <laughs> he is not wearing. Uh, appropriate PPE. Um, I did not clarify what kind of coal, um, but he is under underground uh, coal miner. And this link, unfortunately, isn't. Oh, maybe it is working. Uh, turns out your patient is Larry Zoolander, father of Derek Zoolander. Uh, nobody was exposed to COVID there that he knows of. So I'm um, going to be talking about some of the pneumoconioses, uh, co-worker pneumoconioses, also known as the black lung. Um, results from chronic exposure to coal dust, graphite, and some forms of carbon. Um, and something that we were kind of talking about briefly is um, excuse me, underground miners having the greatest risk uh, compared to those that are on the surface or strip miners. And the prevalence is highest in the central Appalachian region. So if you remember in the movie, I think they're from like Southern New Jersey or something like that. Um, so this is kind of the map uh, of where there's, you know, a high number of cases. I spent some time in Beckley, West Virginia um, during medical school. And I think they're you know, coming out of high school, if you were to start working in the coal mines, you would make uh, around $80,000 a year. Um, so a 17 year old just freshly graduated making $80,000 a year with, a, yeah, with a very low cost of living is a very um, appealing option to a lot of people out there, um, which led to a number of things also. But uh, that was just something that I thought was interesting to point out when you're thinking about where people are from and, and their exposures. Um, this is just a, a little bit of a diagram that will also illustrate some of the main talking points that we're going to be covering in this lecture. And this is the prevalence of um, coal workers pneumoconiosis based over the time frame. And then as you can see, um, the different colors are the years of exposure. So you will see it is dose dependent and duration um, dependent. 
in in all all forms that we're going to cover. Uh, so some of the pathology, again, we'll talk about. Um, so the initial reaction to coal dust is the formation of a coal macule. Um, I got some pathology slides to go over it as well. So when you have this um, coal macule surrounded with focal emphysema, that's going to start to define your coal worker's pneumoconiosis. The macule, which is consisting of the coal uh, dust laden macrophages and fibroblasts, starts to enlarge, <clears throat> loosens the connections between the walls of the alveoli. Uh, and, and causes these focal areas of emphysema. Um, and I have some slides here, so kind of hitting on the point. I have some uh, ones that really uh, make it much better. But you see those cold macules, you see the airways, but then you start to see these focal areas of emphysema here, uh, again, with the cold macules. And just to kind of hit it home again, same thing, cold macules, focal areas of emphysema. Um, some of these pictures are some of the common pictures that are also in um, the board review books as well. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. In regards to the pathogenesis, uh, the severity is closely associated with the levels of coal dust. Um, and coal mine dust that's fractured by grinding contains more free radicals than the unfractured dust. And we'll see that that is how this whole um, cascade really gets going. So, you know, you have your macrophages, alveolar macrophages, as well as some of the lung parenchymal um, macrophages, phagocytose, the, the material, the silica, the coal fibers, the asbestos, leading to reactive oxygen species production, as well as um, reactive nitrogen species, DNA damage. These factors leading up essentially to this fibrotic response. And that's the, some of the reasons that you'll see um, the the changes that we see on PFTs as well as um, imaging. In regards to some of the imaging findings, um, you'll see the nodules, what we had talked about, um, generally pretty small in size initially, favors the upper lobe. And like we talked about, you'll start to see that rim of emphysema surrounding these nodules. This is a chest X-ray that kind of showing these tiny nodular opacities, it's supposed to be favoring the upper lobes, uh, and a CT kind of really, really demonstrating that quite a bit. Um, and then as we move, you'll see some of these start to coalesce, uh, co co-workers pneumoconiosis with progressive massive fibrosis. Uh, these nodules coalesce after years, and you get these huge, uh, like coal masses essentially. And this is a little bit closer to that chest x-ray that I had showed. You see these large uh, opacities, and you still see these tiny little nodular opacities. And then, boom, you see it again. Nodular opacities, the coalescing of all these uh, leading to this large, large um, opacity. And on gross uh, pathology, again, nodular opacities, the huge massive fibrosis. I have a couple pictures just to really hit it home again small starting to coalesce and then you start with the normal lung you're getting exposure over a short time frame these are starting to build up um, exposure it continues to increase you get the black lung pop uh, you get your exposure keeps going higher and then you get in the massive uh, fibrosis associated with it uh, and just side by side kind of putting it all together just a little bit, probably asymptomatic here. Some of the nodular opacities coalescing into that large thing. And then that's the way that you saw it also on um, imaging as well. And same thing here. Technical difficulties. The, um, <clears throat> so silicosis, um, the next one we're going to be talking about, um, one of the earliest lung diseases described uh, in the 1500s, uh, there was described some of the pulmonary effects of inhaling dust from mining. Um, and in the late 1600s, <clears throat> excuse me, similar problems in stone cutters. Um, it's a chronic lung disease that is caused by the inhalation of crystalline silica. Um, and again, characterized by progressive parenchymal nodules and then pulmonary fibrosis. 
some of the occupations with um, silica exposure, mining, tunneling, excavating, um, quarrying of granite, salt, slate, and uh, stand, sandstone. Um, some, some people associated with stonework um, that you see in like uh, masonry. Big one um, is abrasives such as sandblasting. And, and part of the reason is, is with sandblasting, you're getting the generation of these freshly fractured silica particles uh, and kind of in these high doses. Um, so uh, that causing like, um, sometimes you can get an acute silicosis from that, which we'll talk about as well. Uh, one that I thought was interesting was road maintenance uh, in, in people who uh, cut and repair because there can be elevated levels of silica from the cutting and breaking up of, of the concrete. And then again, that inhalation is uh, another additional exposure. You guys may famously have had a pair of sandblasted denim jeans. Um, <laughs> And there was a outbreak following this. Um, this is a <laughs> throwback picture of me in my sandblasted jeans roughly about 15 years ago with this rock star jacket and awesome haircut. Um, I'm not sure why the photographer had us standing like a boy band, but uh, I had to dig for this picture once I saw the sandblasted uh, jeans. So in 2005, there was a silicosis outbreak. Um, it was Turkish uh, laborers involved with the sandblasting denim jeans to fade color. Um, and as you can see, I think Adi had had a question about PPE. I don't think this cloth mask is going to be effective. Um, yeah, uh, to help you know decrease the inhalation of these small particles. Um, and one thing about um, you know the pneumoconioses is uh, a lot also depends upon the particle size. Um, so you you have it's kind of the sweet spot. The the particles that are between one to five micrometers are the ones that are particularly dangerous because these are the ones that can make it down to um, some of the distal alveoli cause that you know um, reaction with the macrophages taken up and then that cascade of fibrosis. Some of the really, really tiny ones that are like 0.5 micrometers can kind of come in and out. And some of the larger ones don't make it all the way to the distal alveoli, kind of get caught in the mucociliary, and then you tend to cough some of those out. But it's that that one to five micrometers um, size particles that are really concerning. Uh, and again, you can see that there's a high amount of, you know, just some of the, the dust that's coming up from these um, and not wearing proper um, attire. So some of the histopathology uh, for silicosis um, is these silicotic nodules. Uh, I got a couple uh, pictures to kind of, again, hit it home um, since repetition helps me and being a visual learner. So this is one classic one that's uh, shown in, in a couple of textbooks as well. Again, the risk of uh, the risk for silicosis, depending on the level of particle exposure, which we talked about, both the dose and the duration, um, as well as the type of silica that is inhaled. Um, whether you'll be asked about this on your boards, I'm not entirely sure, but it was mentioned that quartz, cristobalite, and tridimite are uh, more fiber. fiber fibrogenic than amorphous silica. Uh, and this is kind of what I was talking about, the silica particles that are less than five micrometers in size that can make their way to the distal alveoli. Um, and we were talking about gets ingested by the alveolar macrophages, these silica activated alveolar macrophages release your um, reactive oxygen species, reactive nitrogen species, fibronectin, other cytokines and growth factors, stimulating the act stimulating the expression of uh, TGF beta, resulting in excess of that extracellular matrix deposition and then subsequent fibrosis because of that. Um, additionally, it can also directly injure the alveolar type one cells, um, which can lead to formation of hyperplastic type two cells. And if extensive alveolar damage occurs, um, it can also affect surfactant, surfactant uh, production and um, result in acute silicosis, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, Some of the imaging findings. This picture isn't translating great on the slides, but 
Um, it did have a pretty good of the eggshell classification. Um, strongly suggests uh, silicosis. Again, not very frequent, but if present, um, should be high in your differential, but of note, it is not pathognomic. Uh, so acute silicosis uh, presents within several months after an intense exposure to high levels of silica, such as with sandblasting with little or no respiratory protection. Um, your chest x-ray or chest radiograph can show a diffuse alveolar pattern. Um, sometimes, you know, the symptoms can precede significant radiographic changes as well. Presents with dyspnea, cough, pleuritic pain, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as weight loss. Like any other presentation, your uh, evaluation is aimed at a good occupational history as well. Just, uh, you know, we had to try to ask a good question, what did the patient do? Um, and just like any other, any other process, you got to rule out other processes that um, may be going on, especially common things, you know, pneumonia, CHF, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, as well as pulmonary proteinosis, uh, alveolar proteinosis, um, which is something that I'm going to talk about shortly as well, just based on some similarities, which I thought were very interesting. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So this is a chest radiograph showing you know, these bilateral opacities tending to favor the lower lung fields, um, asymmetrical, um, and then acute silicosis. So anybody want to just mention the buzzword that you think of when you see this? From, from a radiological standpoint, like, I'm sorry, two words. Yeah, crazy paving. So, you know, that's the, the ding, ding, ding that you always uh, hear with uh, PAP uh, and part of, you know, what's been described to, you know, here in, in patients with acute silicosis. Um, you can also get a BAL in these patients with acute silicosis and uh, to kind of really, go with it. Also seen it referred to as acute silical proteinosis, which also makes me think of <clears throat> PAP. Uh, BAL can yield a thick milky effluent similar to PAP uh, and very similar to PAP as well. Uh, macrophages and BAL are foamy um, and they stain positive with PAS. So um, something in your consideration as well in regards to occupational history. Some of the clinical features, um, you can have an accelerated acute forms of silicosis, which we have kind of briefly talked about, um, presenting within months or few years after intense silica exposure. The dyspnea occurs after you know, a few years of high levels of exposure that have those moderate to high levels of um, silica. These patients tend to progress pretty quickly, it seems like, to respiratory failure. Um, chronic silicosis is the more common form occurring after low dose exposure for a long time. Um, so again, dose and duration. Most patients are relatively asymptomatic um, and then you may get a chest x-ray for something and you see some of those changes. You start asking them about exposure, what they do for work and things like that. And you start to think of this as um, you know, one of the possibilities for what's going on for them. This is a little bit more of the chronic form Again, you're starting to see a little bit more of those bigger areas of fibrosis along with some of those changes that you were seeing. Um, PFT is not gonna be like, you know, guaranteed the same for everybody, obviously. Um, in early silicosis, you may see some normal volumes, flow, diffusion, but diffusion would be the one that you start to see reduced as the disease progresses. As you can tell, it's kind of damaging lung parenchyma. Um, and you, you, can, you can start to see a progressive restrictive pattern as well. Some of the complications which are, um, I think, commonly asked or tested uh, is in regards to pulmonary tuberculosis. So there's a threefold um, greater risk for developing TB in patients with chronic silicosis uh, versus healthy individuals. And this risk actually persists even after your silica exposure has stopped. Um, in about you know, 16,000 deaths associated with silicosis in the US between 68 and 2006, almost 14% of them had TB. And this is because, um, like we were talking about, silica impairs those alveolar macrophage function, uh, in, leading to the increased risk of mycobacterium infections, uh, not just TB. Um, and there is a study that I think I have a slide on as well. So because of this impaired host defense mechanism and 
as well as decreased drug penetration into these silicolytic nodules. It's suggested that um, your therapy is extended for two months beyond the typical course. So rather than a six month course, yeah. So here um, there was controlled clinical comparison of six uh, month duration versus eight month duration uh, in patients with silico uh, tuberculosis in Hong Kong. 240 patients um, were either allocated to the six month or the eight month treatment group. Uh, and at their three year assessment, the relapse had occurred in 22% of the patients in that six month group versus 7% uh, in the eight month, eight month group. Uh, and, and that's why they're recommending that you treat for two months longer than the typical duration. Um, and this was a, a pretty good, <clears throat> not a real patient of mine or anything like that, but um, a good chest x-ray kind of showing this cavitary uh, area up here. And that's when you want to start to be concerned or start thinking about TB in these patients um, with silicosis as well. You've got to have a pretty high suspicion um, for TB in, in patients who are having, you know, changes, hemoptysis, uh, weight loss, things like that. In terms of treatment for silicosis, there's no specific treatment. Um, as we talked about, it has to do with exposure. So avoiding the exposure is a big thing as well. Um, <clears throat> whole lung lavage was something that I thought was very interesting in regards to silicosis. Um, I've been able to see one whole lung lavage in my life. Um, and there was a, a case report where a whole lung lavage was done successfully for silicosis. And thinking back to some of the previous slides, we talked about um, some similarities to PAP as well, the imaging, the the BAL fluid, the PAS positive staining. So this is from that case report. It's from the University of Colorado. Um, so the it was a younger guy, I think in his like low to mid thirties who had uh, presented with worsening shortness of breath. Um, they had taken their occupational history. They were, history, they were concerned for um, silicosis and they uh, he ended up uh, getting whole lung lavage. So this is, before this on um, the left side of the screen is um, after right lung lavage. And this is after both right and left lung lavage. Uh, patient tolerated it very well. This is his actual fluid. Uh, and if you've seen the pictures or seen a uh, whole lung lavage for PAP, uh, very similar to that fluid where that um, that material just really, you know, starts to go down to the bottom and settle uh, that proteinous, proteinaceous material. Um, patient was discharged uh, home uh, just a couple days after lung lavage, it sounds like. Um, another one that I thought was interesting was lung transplantation. Um, there was a series of um, patients that had lung transplant done um, for um, multiple um, lung diseases, uh, 19 of these patients had silicosis uh, and their six month, one year, three year survivals were 86, 86 and 76%. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. They also seem to do better than um, some of the, the patients that were transplanted for other processes like co-workers and pneumoconiosis as well. Wasn't entirely sure as to why that was the case though. Um, the next one you know, we'll be talking about is asbestos related diseases. And yeah, sorry. So in these patients, you're um, also monitoring their chest radiographs uh, almost like yearly to every other year as well. Um, and then uh, that's, that's kind of mostly what I was able to see. Yeah. Um, Excuse me. So the first case of asbestos associated fibrosis uh, described in the 1900s. And we started to notice, you know, asbestos associated, associated bronchogenic carcinoma, as well as asbestos associated mesothelioma. Um, an estimated 27 million workers uh, in the United States were exposed to aerosolized asbestos fibers between 1940 and 1979. Dr. Galani provided me with this nice picture of, uh, you know, asbestos, when you start to think of your old homes, um, that's always the concern, right, when you're doing any remodeling or anything like that. So some of the risk factors, 
again, um, exposure um, in terms of mining and milling of these fibers, as well as the industrial applications of asbestos. And I think this is where, again, your cl uh, clinical history, occupational history really gets in. In patients with textiles, uh, insulation, shipbuilding is a big one, brake linings is another big one, pipe fitting and pipe cutting are some of the big ones that are, um, you know, relevant that we we think of when we, when we see um, asbestos related diseases and I think board exams as well. Um, as you see, the majority of patients have had significant exposure over a prolonged time period. Um, so you have your types of asbestos fibers. Uh, you have your serpentine versus the amphibial. Um, one thing that was interesting here is these amphibial fibers accumulate more readily in that distal lung parenchyma and they're not cleared very well, um, making them more durable, lasting a longer time in the lungs. Uh, and if you think about, it, again, which we have talked about probably about 14 times, dose and duration. Um, so that can cause that higher um, uh, damage that's going on and, and changes and resulting with it. All right, and go back to my genes. Vape, uh, benign asbestos pleural effusions can have varying um, presentations. The time period between uh, development of vape after exposure is quite varying, anywhere between like one to 40 years, apparently. Um, you may present with just asymptomatic blunting of the costophrenic angles, as well as some chest, pleuric chest pain, fevers, dyspnea, or maybe even pleur uh, bloody pleural fluid you will see um, an oxidative effusion as well as uh, elevated ESR. Um, one thing that you s we see kind of frequently, I think maybe even on board questions as well, is pleural plaques in regards to asbestos. Um, these are areas of fibrosis on the parietal pleura. Uh, and over time, these lesions will start to calcify and they really show up on your imaging. Um, more frequent in males uh, versus females. And there was no evidence to, to suggest that these pleural plaques increase the risk uh, for development of mesothelioma or of lung cancer. Oh, I there. Um, malignant mesothelioma is one that you know we see on uh, TV uh, commercials and things like that as well. Um, caused by all forms of asbestos occurring in the parietal pleura. Um, male to female ratio is pretty high, five to one in the age range being elderly, 50 to 70, 70 years. Again, the uh, exposure of a long time frame um, and consequently nearly 3,000 deaths annually in the United States. You can have some non specific complaints um, with it fever, weight loss, night sweats, fatigue, dyspnea, pleuritic chest pain, cough, kind of a varying uh, presentation. Can be pretty generic, excuse me. Um, they frequently uh, see these as a pleural effusion. And the sensitivity of thoracentesis is about 25%. There was one case series uh, that had a little over 200 patients that had a sensitivity of about 33%. So in this um, case study or case series, all patients had histologically proven um, malignant mesothelioma based on pleural biopsies. They retrospectively went back uh, and compared it with um, cytology from thoracentesis that the patient had had prior um, to see, and then that kind of gave it a 33% sensitivity there. Um, and we talked about in this case series, 83% of patients were male, ages between 48 and 88, with a median age of 71. So kind of going back to your male that is somewhere in that 50 to 70 year age range. Some of the guidelines in regards to the, the monitoring and treatment of um, malignant mesothelioma from the Associated, uh, American Society of Clinical Oncology, um, some things that will just kind of make sense. Uh, initial thoracentesis when somebody's presenting with a symptomatic pleural fusion, I think that makes sense, sending pleural fluid for cytology. Um, any patients that may get um, chemotherapy, the recommended thoracoscopic biopsy to obviously confirm the uh, diagnosis. It also helps in the, in the staging. Uh, additionally, they're able to send it for 
um, more molecular profiling, which I think I have um, in some of the slides as well. Uh, and one big thing was to determine the pathology, pathology subtype of mesothelioma in terms of epithelial, sarcomatoid, and biphasic because there is um, different um, prognosis with these as well. Uh, the, the examination should be supplemented with some of the immunohistochemistry uh, using these selected markers. Um, I'm expecting everybody to remember all of these, the calretinin, keratins 5 and 6, um, and then and, uh, some of the ones that are you expect to be negative as well, some of the CA and uh, TTF1. In regards to staging, um, they do recommend a CT chest and abdomen, at least upper abdomen with IV contrast. Um, in any patients that are being considered for surgical resection, a PET CT to make sure that there isn't involvement elsewhere. Um, and if you do see any pleural abnormalities um, on PET, contralateral abnormalities on PET CT, uh, also recommending a contralateral thoracoscopy to further evaluate as well. Um, and this is, uh, of that classic thickening uh, pleura that you, you'll see on CT. Excuse me. Pleural thickening, the pleural effusion as well. And uh, just talking about um, mortality in patients based on their staging uh, and going with time. In regards to chemotherapy, the first line chemotherapy is uh, pemetrexid plus platinum therapies. Uh, the clinical trial that supported this was published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, and they did a study of, uh, again, pemetrexid combined with cisplatin versus cisplatin alone, uh, and both regimens being given every 21 days um, IV. Patients in this study were chemotherapy naive, uh, as well as not eligible for curative surgery. Um, a little over 450 patients split up, 226 and 222. In the combination uh, group, the median survival time was about 12 months versus nine months. The median time to progression um, being almost six months versus four months, quite significant as well. Um, and then the response rates being about 41% versus 16%. And I think that is my last slide. Changed at all. Um, you do you can see some of the highlight retraction on um, the images. I didn't have uh, any there. Or with silica. Uh, hey, uh, Dr. Morris had mentioned um, a lot of uh, some of the ones in regards to um, coal exposure with silica as well. Thanks.